Welcome to the Swipe Right Effect podcast, where we will be sharing with you the power to get unstuck by swiping right on yourself. Your host, author C.K. Collins, a.k.a. Kelly, gets personal with her guests, sharing stories of themselves getting unstuck with wisdom and guidance. Where do you feel stuck? Are you waiting to get your new life started after a big change? You've come to the right place. So with that said, let's get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm C.K. Collins, also known as Kelly, and this is the Swipe Right Effect the power to get unstuck. Our podcast today is hosting Frances Baldwin, and I cannot wait for you to meet her. Let me tell you a little bit about her before we get started. Um, As Frances told me a few minutes ago, she had a life before she got into the corporate world. She was a wife and a teacher, but she felt like something was missing and she had some shifts in life um, and she became an independent consultant. And she told me she was spurred on by experiences that she had had in her life. And so, Frances, I can't wait to talk about these experiences and talk about the momentum effect and how and your part in that. So welcome to the show today. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. <laughs> looking forward to all of it, working with you on the momentum effect, the podcast, all of it. So um Tell us what else you would like us to know about you before we get started. Well, I think one of the primary things to know is that I live and speak from my knowledge, but mostly from my experience. So the things I'm talking about are not just things I've read about or just written about. They're things I've lived. Mm -hmm. So I feel comfortable saying to people, this is something you might want to think about, you want to try because I've, I've lived it. And the other thing you talked about, um, I was living the life, you know, married with a son, teaching, doing very well. And uh, something really happened, that marriage failed. But it made me realize that was not, that marriage wasn't bringing me where I was headed. And so that was the shocker that sort of moved me in. And then I moved into doing a different kind of work, went into corporations for 13 years, left that, started my own business, and here I am now, the Wisdom Keeper. Wisdom Keeper. I love it. And today yeah. you're going to share things from your wisdom box, right? From my <laughs> little wisdom. I have this wisdom box that I keep on the lock and key, but I'm opening it up today and looking forward to uh, as many women as possible to learn from that. Oh, that's amazing. Great. So, Francis' role in the Momentum Effect, which is a program where wise women connect. Francis is going to be our first masterclass teacher, and we're going to be talking about life purpose and embodying your life purpose, and even with your very presence. And so today, Francis suggested we talk about the mindset of preparation, getting ready for growth and change. So can share with us about that. I will. You know, one of the things that uh, helped me to focus on it, I remember today a woman I met years ago. She was a pioneer in women's change. And I'll give you her uh, name so you can put it into the podcast. It's Natasha Josevich. Most people have never heard of Natasha, uh, Natasha. And I read something. I was looking for something today on this book. This is not where I was going. <laughs> and realized Natasha died in March at 97 years old. But she came into my mind as I was getting ready for this. So something she said, uh, help me with this. Uh, She said, after one door closes and before a new one opens, it could be awfully dark in the hallway. But if you stay there long enough, you'll see a crack of light under the new door. You can push it open and enter into your new life. And I'm thinking that might represent where people are or want to be. And so what we're talking about is we're in the hallway today talking about how do we create the mindset to do good work while you're in the hallway. Um, So there are a number of things that I'll just get into it talking about it. So this is the statement. If I had to make a statement today that I thought was important because change is not easy because we are so human and so practiced in our habits and the way that we think, and they've served us well. They need to serve us to move us forward or to keep us safe. 
So change isn't easy. So if I had to make a statement today, I would say that as people, not just as women, you must appreciate yourself, the body, the mind, the spirit that you were given. You must appreciate that enough to want to live into a better version of yourself. Mm. But first you have to appreciate that God gave you this body, this mind, et cetera, you know, without being critical of yourself um, enough that you want to move into a better version of yourself. And you must have a dream for lack of a better word. Now that dream, my dream shifted from the time I was a little girl dreaming about growing up, living in New York, working in a corporation. That shifted over time. But even as it shifted, it's because um, over these different thresholds, that dream deepened, it got more expansive, but it was still headed in the same direction. So we have to have at least a path that we are dreaming on. And I know we have just saw that kind of work uh, in the program. And so this appreciation and having this dream and call is having a will for better. Mm. And that language, I wish I owned it, having a will for better. I remember reading an article from Ed Shine and Otto Shama, and um, I forgot the other person's name now, but they talk about some people have a will for better. They want to make life better around them. You know, it starts out with making your bed in the morning means a lot to me. You know, it just makes me feel when I get ready to go back, that's a fresh bed. Yeah. But wanting to make things around you better, wanting to make your life better, your work better. Some people have a will inside of them for this. And when you can appreciate yourself, I think it builds that will. And the other thing would be having expectations and beliefs. I was also reading as I was thinking about this, how beliefs actually change your brain. That's why people can have the placebo effect with medications. You know, people can be really having pain, literal pain, and the doctor gives them something and guarantees them this is going to relieve your pain. And even though it's a placebo, they believe it so firmly that it changes the endorphins in your brain and you feel better. And that's how strong belief can be. I mean, I think that's what faith and religion is all about. You know, I saw that in my mother. She believes things so well that they came, they came true. So um, one is to have this expectation and to believe. Believe in yourself. Believe that it can happen, especially when you get knocked down. Believe you can, uh, you can get up again. And I think what helps us with this is creating a space that I call the indwelling in a space. And Kelly, this is what people don't do a lot of work on. What is it I must do? What is it I must learn? What is it I must become? When the baseline work is how must I be inside of myself? How must I have the courage, the inner strength, the belief, the resilience inside of myself that's going to serve all these things that I want to do and become? So it's putting first the being, and then talk about the doing because that prepares you for it. And that space, you know, is what creates that word that you asked me, you wanted to ask me about this buoyancy. Mm -hmm. I talked about buoyancy and it's like, so when there's buoyancy, there's more energy going up than down. So you can take a heavy object and put it in the water and it will float on the water because the water has so much buoyancy that it can hold it up. And that's what it is inside of us. It's that spirit, that energy, that positive uh, inspiration. They have that buoyancy in us. You know, I get that when I'm like preparing this morning now, I'm like, you know, I, I just, I just, it just really comes up. But over time you can create that capacity in yourself because you can start your day out. I can start my day out feeling tired, having pain in all the arthritic parts of my body and feeling like I don't. And then something happens to distract my attention to, and I can just get myself into that place. And I think that happens with practice. Um, and that practice I want to talk about also. And that practice I call 
contemplative practices. Mm. Having that practice where you go inside of yourself, be quiet with yourself and be thoughtful with yourself that allows you to just be with yourself. So one of the ways that, that I know the most about, the two I know the most about are meditation and prayer. So meditation, true meditation, as I've experienced it now for almost 50 years, true meditation is a way of quieting yourself and allowing all the thoughts that come up in your mind. And we know what happens when you get quiet. They just start coming at you, the thoughts. So true meditation allows you to have a process and mostly it's having a mantra, having a sound or word that just reminds you, it's like Pablo, you know, when I hear my mantra and my uh, meditation, it reminds me to be quiet. Mm. And the thoughts as he come until the thoughts are just gone, they're all gone. And then you're in a quiet space. And if the listeners and you, um, who may have had this experience already know, but if you haven't had this experience, try to remember if you're awake and you're not thinking about anything, you're just in a suspended, quiet, restful place. So when you come out of the meditation, your mind is very clear. You have renewed energy. You feel fresh. Mindfulness and effortlessness, just a rare place. So if I've been doing this for 50 years, I would say almost half of that time, I didn't get into a true true meditation space. I get close, but half of the time, over that period of time, I can get into that true meditation space. And even if you don't do it well, you still feel better coming out of it. But having some kind of practice. Yeah, and practice means you got to keep on doing it. <laughs> you don't just do one meditation and all of a sudden you feel better. It is, it's some, you got to keep going back and keep doing it. And I think, you know, trying to get better at it too, like, you know, learn, seeking out and learning different ways to do it. And yes, guided, yeah. guided meditations are a good way to start because it kind of keeps mm -hmm. you going, but it's right. that really quiet, silent meditation is where I find that I can go deeper. The guided meditation is when I'm just so distracted, I can't get my mind quiet. Then yeah. that's when I like to use guided, but it's, and it's a big difference. There's a lot more peace that comes from the silent meditation, I think. Right. And like you said, that takes practice. Mm -hmm. And so every time I sit down to meditate, it's like it's the first time I'm remembering what it is I'm trying to do and remembering to get myself in position. So and we know what practice is like. It's just amazing what you practice, you become better at, mm -hmm. that, even at, even the negative things, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent point. <laughs> Yeah, we, we become, we become. if you don't believe it, just eat chocolate with nuts for two or three days. You know, all of a sudden, everything is about chocolate with nuts. You know? <laughs> but, you know, people have different ways of doing it. For some people, it's just deep listening. For some people, it's writing. And I have noticed that. I don't write enough. But when I'm writing, thoughts come to me that wouldn't otherwise. Like if I'm speaking, when I'm writing, it's a meditative. For some people, it's even running. Mm -hmm. But it's whatever puts you into that zone of quietness. Yeah, I've definitely experienced that with hiking, mm -hmm. um, especially when I was on the Camino, because it would be 12 miles a day. And there would just be certain points in the day. I'd just be like, how did I get here? <laughs> like, I mean, obviously I'm on the path and I'm walking, but I would go so deep into that quiet place that it was, and I learned to meditate while hiking. And I'd love to do that now. I love to hike with other people, but when I am by myself and in a beautiful place, I just, it, it it's become one of the most important places for me to go. Is well, so let me ask you a question about that, Kelly. When you find yourself in that space, do you experience a difference in your way of seeing what's around you mm -hmm. than at other times? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm, it's more of a, um, almost like a kaleidoscope around me. Like I really am just looking, you know, at the exact place my feet are going to go. And so there's a rhythm to it and it's almost like a drum beat. And then everything else just kind of goes out of focus, I guess. 
So you just described to a T mindfulness. Mm. So you're you're right there. Your everything in your attention is right there. You're very much aware of everything right there, and that is mindfulness. And I think these contemplative practices help us with that, which is very hard to come to in the world that we're in. You know, you could you, you know you can't afford to just go in the kitchen and cook. You know, you got to stop and do this. You got to stop and do that. Whatever you're doing, you can't afford just to sit down to your computer and plan your work. Something comes to mind, you gotta do this, you gotta stop and do that. So mindfulness is one of the benefits of contemplative practice. And I think you just described um, the benefits of having those practices. Mm. So another thing I wanna talk about very cautiously is setting boundaries around your world. Mm. So after having had a negative experience, if I can call my 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 marriage, I can't call a negative experience because God has gave us the most wonderful son. And I came to a point where my with my ex, so we were forgiving of each other. Right. So I don't like to think of it more as a negative, but it's definitely a growing experience. It wasn't where I was um where I was headed. But it helped me to understand that some things must be in my world and some things must be out of my world. So I have to set boundaries that I value and regard and that I hold gently because when we set boundaries, that means some things are in and we are closing some things out. And uh, one of the examples I tell people is how you surround yourself, who you surround yourself with is one of the boundaries that you set. And at some point we realize, we come to realize that some people in our lives bring not the energy that we want um and other people bring the energy that we we seek more of those people who are like-minded the caution is don't outgrow your friends don't outgrow your loved ones your husband your lover and i've seen people that you know they're just on a path don't outgrow these people who've been so much a part of you and have made you who you are so you have to find when we're setting these boundaries we have to find a way of bringing people with us because setting a boundary is an inner process in your mind. People don't know it. So, you know, you don't want your friends saying, what's wrong with her? You know, she doesn't do this anymore. It's okay to share some of these things, but I'm just experimenting with something. I'm trying something, but we definitely have to set boundaries and realize those boundaries must shift and change over time. Um, some of the things who you thought were in and important, you know, one of the places where I've made this shift is thinking about women as women developing ourselves. And there are different ways we develop ourselves. Some women develop themselves uh, with men being the enemy, you know? So it's like, how can I become this so that I make men the enemy? Which is taking your energy, pulling it back to something and also demonizing someone you may not need, need to demonize. So what I want to think about is how to move myself forward in the face of, um, you know, the world that men have created that we have now penetrated quite well, I must say, as women. <laughs> we, we, have, we, we are really into this. It's no longer a man's world, you know? Right. We are, I think women are really, really, um, really penetrating that. But thinking about moving forward without having to push someone else, um, mm. someone else out or backward. Yeah, that's interesting. And going back to boundaries. Um, so I, mean, I feel like what you're talking about, if I'm understanding correctly, is that's emo emotional boundaries and kind of structuring your life when you're going through or attempting to do this deep dive work we're going to do in the momentum effect, do you advise to do also set physical boundaries? Um, one of my coaches had told me to have a workshop, like go to a place like, and everybody in the family and everybody in the house knows this is where we're going to be at this time. And, and there's a physical boundary here so that I can get this very important work done. And Absolutely. yeah. yeah. And yeah, just having a space, you know, so you're looking at, at my space. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is my space, you know, it's green. It's very rewarding. You know, I have all of my little African pieces that speak to me, 
But in this setting, it's like when I come into this setting, I'm here to either do brain work on the computer with my puzzles or whatever, answer my email or develop. But it's creating, yes, a space of familiarity uh, to do that. Um, but I think there are other kind of boundaries. There are things that we, um, you know, we don't do. I'm working with a client um, now, and I was telling someone um, what a good experience I had of presenting to my client's clients. Mm. So I'm like this, like a shadow for another professional consultant. And I presented to his client and I was saying how well received. And the person said, oh, they may want to hire you. And I said, you know, that's something I never do. Yeah. Um, I will not work with a friend, a client's client, just because I'm exposed to them. And um, if they like, I just don't do that. It's just something okay. about it. So there are moral boundaries. Well, I was going to say ethical. Yep. Yeah. Moral. Yeah, and, yeah. Moral and ethical boundaries that we set that, that help right. us. But, it, you know, but there's, so they're all kind of, uh, they're all kind of boundaries. And the the, the harder ones to, to set are things like discipline, like, you know, I'm not going to eat any sugar for a month. Um, and you get sugar on your mind so much, you know, you're ready to. <laughs> lick it off the floor <laughs> you but want the, it so bad <laughs> but the idea kelly of setting boundaries is so powerful mm. because it helps you to shape 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 and then you look at you know how and you learn from someone else's boundaries you know you realize someone else does something either in an ethical way or uh, like one of the things that served me so well is my sense of humor and I just will not give that up. And, you know, sometimes I tell a joke and I'm laughing harder than anyone else because I really get it, you know, but. I like my own jokes too. <laughs> I, I, I really like my own jokes, especially when they come naturally. So yeah, how are we doing on time? We're good. Okay, good. So the boundary setting process is really being conscious about what I want. Now, journaling helps with that. I don't know if you're mentioning that, but writing and journaling helps with all of these things that we talked about because there's a way in which doing this inner work means talking to yourself, having a conversation with yourself and writing these things now. So generally. It is. I, and you mentioned that earlier about um, some people can like through writing becomes yes. like meditation. When I was writing my book, it absolutely felt like it was coming through me almost mm -hmm. like subconsciously, unconsciously. And I kept saying, boy, God's doing a good job writing this book because <laughs> I don't even know where this is coming from, but, right. but it came. Yeah. But, and I was very, I, I set boundaries like, you know, and that my phone was off. I told my friends I'm not available in this time. And somebody had suggested to me to follow Ernest Hemingway's writing style. Like he had a, he would sit down and say, I'm gonna write 600 words today. And I don't get up until I write them. And I don't get up until I know what the, the character is going to do next. And so I set up my rules like that around my writing. And it made me probably a hundred times more productive because I had put those boundaries out and, and I needed to do this work. I needed to get this book out of my head. And so, it, but it felt meditative. It felt, yes. so all of, I'm just recognizing like all of these pieces that you're talking about when I did the hard work of writing the book, like I just, I guess I instinctively did it because <laughs> I didn't know you yet. <laughs> well, this is fascinating uh, because it talks about us as individuals. Mm -hmm. Because if I were to sit down and say, okay, I'm not going to get up until I, I may be sitting there for a very long time because <laughs> I respond when things come. Four o'clock in the morning is my magic hour. I'm usually asleep. But if I wake up and I have an idea, I used to jump up and go to work. Now, as I'm older, I have paper. I write down these things because it starts coming through me. So when I started thinking about what I wanted to share today, I was sitting with my breakfast and I had to take out my phone, my little thing, and write these notes down. This is their coming. So they're just coming just like that. So I'm responding to when I'm in the flow as, you know, the book flow. Mm -hmm. Um I, I, I'm in the flow. I, I can do it whenever I do it. 
Unfortunately, it sometimes doesn't work for my deadlines and my clients, you know, who are expecting things. <laughs> or when I hit it, I'm good. But I realize that about myself, which means I need to start earlier to give myself time for, mm-hmm. you know, having those. But we do, we are different individually. So I want to speak a little bit about, you know, seeking knowledge and um, what we do with our knowledge. I read someplace recently, I think it was in Meg Wheatley's latest book, uh, and I can't remember who said it. So, you know, getting a knowledge and understanding is one thing. What you're able to do with that is the most important thing. And I, I wanted to talk about that because if books and even lectures and podcasts and workshops could change us if we could just change as a consequence of being exposed to knowledge, it would be easier. But it's what we take with from these um, experiences from knowledge. First of all, we need to be learners and seekers. So we are looking for, and I'm a reader. I love reading. And unfortunately, I love reading hard books. So um, my little Kindle is full, but my bookshelf still runneth over because I love having a book in my hand and, and marking it. But once you get this knowledge and these understanding, these concepts and these practices, and this is part of that inner work, mm. for every nugget, for everything that you study and learn, there may be in there a nugget of essence that you want to be able to hold on to. What's the key? What's the centerpiece? What is it that I can pull from this that's going to be important? Mm. And when you find those, and sometimes we hear and say, wow, that was good. You may even write it down. But Mm. I say, go back and chew on it, think on it, and try to make it a part of who you are inside, of what you value inside. And that is the work that I believe gets us to wisdom is because we get in the habit of pulling out the essence of what we learn. You know, what's the nugget? uh, What's the energy and centerpiece here? And the more we digest that and um, make it a part of the way we think or the way we want to be. And that's the freedom, Terry. We can change ourselves and we can become the person we want to be at any time if we just have what it takes and takes a lot of work. Um, But to me, that's how we develop wisdom because just think if I'm pulling the essence out of so many life experiences, out of so much knowledge, so much reading, so much teaching, then I have a core of rich stuff Mm -hmm. that connects, stuff connects with stuff. You know, a woman sent me a book to read the other day and I said to myself, didn't you realize that Kurt Lewin said this in 19... 40 something, um, because I can make the connection right away uh, between all of that. And the thing that's important about that is when we talk about the person we want to be, what happens to us when we internalize stuff, make us a part of us, then we represent that. So if one of the things I want to act on that I want to be true is I want to believe that people have the ability to solve their own problems. I'm simply here to create the conditions and to facilitate that. If I really believe that, you will see it in the way that I teach and the way I work with people. If I'm treating you like you're in fifth grade and trying to give you all of this instead of trying to help you digest it, if I believe it, I will demonstrate it. And I think that's what happens with wisdom is the essence and knowledge that we can demonstrate through the way we act without articulating, demonstrate it. Because we believe in it. Yeah. I do th- I do think oh, go ahead. No, I I want to make sure we say something about love before we finish. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> um well I just wanted to ask you about that that seeking, that learning. And I think not everybody has it at every moment in their life. And so, you know, with the women who are coming through and and sitting at the table with us at the momentum effect it's like that's what i'm looking for in in the person to come participate is the seeking and the yearning and i just was wondering if you had like i don't know where that comes from or how it happens and it feels like a soul calling to me like it's something that's there like something's coming get ready um time to step out of your comfort zone and go get, go get your new life. You know, I, yeah. 
you know, I, it is, I don't think everyone brings it, but I think in a way that we work with people, you know, uh, years ago, we, um, someone came up with the bright idea of experiential learning, mm -hmm. giving people experience to ground an idea and also of um, experiments. So when I'm um, teaching, when I'm sharing with someone um, and we do some work, I try to put in pauses. And I'll give you one example. You know, I, I notice it all the time. Um, people say, well, I have a question for you and I want you to really think about this question. Um, what is the most important um, message you want to convey to the people who work with you? And then they are starting the talking. Well, I haven't thought about that. So people talk and work off the top of their heads. If we say, this is what I want you to share, I want you to sit there, write about it, think about it for a few minutes, what you want to share. And then they, just like you said, when you write, they will have a, they have a time to decide what that is for them and realize they do have something of value or that's peculiar to them that someone else might learn from. But if you just ask them the questions and now go into a group, so whoever starts talking first sets the direction. I haven't thought about anything. I get triggered by something someone else says. And so the, the, the pureness of what I bring doesn't get shared. So it's building into the learning process, hmm. those pauses, reflections, uh, times, and teaching people to do that time to pause and, and reflect. And also to appreciate um, what learning feels like. Like um, there's a program that I did called uh, When Women Lead From Within, that as women, we bring certain qualities. And when we use that as leaders in the on the larger stage, it's, it's unique and it's valuable. That's why you have so many heads of state that are women, if you look in the last 25 or 30 years, because mm. we realize that leadership and governance needed something that um, that women bring and lose them a point. The point I was making was. Kind of making space for people and. Make it, yeah, making that space for having time to think about it. So one of the questions in that program of, for women I asked people was, um, I want you to think about a time when you thought you were most effective whether it was planned or not, whether in a key moment you came up with an idea or what in personal life or in your professional life. Think of a moment you were most effective. And I want you to tell me, what do you most remember about yourself in that moment? Mm. Not what you did, what you remember about yourself. Wow. How fearful I was how courageous yes. <laughs> I was, Vulnerable. how daring. I look back <laughs> and say, did I, did I really say that? Did I really do that? Yeah. But remember things about yourself in that moment, because those are the things that buoy you on. Those are the things that, you know, that you, you build off of. And you're remembering that you have that and you can go there. It doesn't have to be just in that moment. So things like that slow people down, I think it helps people too. To, to learn. Um, but, you know, for some people it's just, and then for some people if they just have a great learning experience, they decided, you know, mm -hmm. and people learn in different ways too. That's true. I had, um, I had, I used to do executive education at Exxon and this happened to me so often because one of the programs that I did was around the personal development of high level executives, something they never got. Once they got in there, you know, looking at your life, how you work with your children, how you love your family, are you putting your family before your success and really deep into personal stuff. And the um, the upper up and coming executives used to tell me all the time, if senior managers knew what you were doing down here, they'd shut this down. <laughs> but I saw a miraculous thing happen to guys on the go, slow down. And the experience I used to have is uh, I remember I had been out of the country for a long time and I came back, I was in New Jersey and I was walking across the parking lot to the building 
And this guy grabbed me by the shoulders. He said, Florence, Florence, I'm so glad to see you. How have you been? I never got a chance to tell you how my life changed when I was in management three. I learned so much. My wife appreciates you. My children appreciate you. And I said, I'm so happy for you. Kelly, I had no idea who he was and didn't mind that he called me Florence. And stuff. <laughs> but one of the things that I've had- I wonder happen, where there's a punchline coming on that. <laughs> Um, I had to happen in airports, et cetera, like that. But usually uh, it's people who have discovered, have learned after the fact when they are living out and then something comes to them. So sometimes people are learning and we don't even, we don't even realize it. Yeah. All right. You said you want to talk about love. <laughs> I want to talk about love because somehow I think it's the capacity and the expression of love that drives all of this, mm. you know? When I went to work for, for Exxon, I had been working in uh, schools and private sec uh, public sector all the time. And I knew I was now about to go sleep with the enemy, you know, I'm going for big oil. <laughs> <laughs> At some time I came to appreciate that, not the Exxon logo, but when you in Europe, and you're always on foreign soil or some way, there's always a different language. Hmm. I came to appreciate the SO sign. I felt like I was someplace safe when there was an SO location. And the thing that I, um, I realized is that I love my work. I come to love the people that I'm working with in a way. There's a way in which I love them. It's not the romantic kind of love but I enjoy being there, enjoy helping them, you know? And it's like, you know, it's like loving um, a child. You love your husband, you love, but there's a way in which your capacity to care and to love drives our ability to all of this hmm. Like I used to say to people sometimes, wish I didn't care so much, you know, yeah. because, um, and I, I will tell you the, the the story that makes it hard to talk about love in the company that you work for. Uh, sometimes I had just started work in, in Exxon and I went to uh, interview one of the consultants that had been there for a long time. And I'm sitting there, I'm excited because I'm working the, for the largest company in the country maybe uh, for the first time. I'm working for corporate America, didn't have much experience. And I'm very excited and I went to talk to this guy. And um, so we had dinner. And then the next day I met him at his office and I was feeling so down and depressed. And I realized here's a person who's there to help the people in the organization grow. He never said a positive thing about the people, the company, everything he said was negative. And I was thinking, is that what's gonna happen to me? And then I realized, no. no. And I pointed it out to him and I said, you know what, how can you be helpful? How can you work wholeheartedly for an organization that you not only don't like, you dislike? What are you doing to yourself as you did? Because you can't give up yourself. And it was a rude awakening for him. And I'm telling you, six months, he retired and sent me all his books and went to run a cafe in Northern California. Wow. Huh. But, you know, to me- I probably couldn't see it. He was so in it. He, couldn't he was see so it. in it. Yeah. And it couldn't figure out the question of why are you doing this? It's the money really that doesn't mean that much. He realized that's not the way he wanted to live his life. And he was there because that's where he thought. And I learned a lesson from him. And I was so surprised when he sent me all of his books. Hmm. And said, I'm my wife and I opened in a cafe. I just want to be out with people doing good things, etc. But anyway, I want to talk about love because um uh I can't think of the game guy's name that Macharana said, you know, we only have the life we create, and it's love that helps us to create. We have the life we create with others, mm -hmm. and it's love that helps us to create it. So I just think it's a driving force for all of us. Yeah.
So you also mentioned the spiritual place, like mm-hmm. having a spiritual place that's non-negotiable. Yes. Yes. It's non-negotiable. So for me, that spiritual place, the heart of it, the seat of it is this religious practice that I have. I'm a Christian and that drives me. There's a bigger spirituality around it all uh, that has to do with contemplation and um, the love um, that has to do with uh, just the mysticism of life itself. Mm-hmm. Just how could I think of Natasha uh, Jacobic, um, Jacobic this morning, months after she died? I haven't thought about her in years. She came to mind and she had the very thing I wanted to share with you today. So there's something bigger than us that guides us. And I think the more we practice our spirituality, our contemplation, the more we tap into that. And in my life experience, I found that that's very valuable. And it fuels all of this logic and hard work and knowledge and all of this stuff. The spiritual part of me fuels uh, my ability to do my work well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you had also mentioned Roly Poly. I want to mention <laughs> Roly Poly. So if you think about all the things that we've talked about, the objective is to be um, enriched, but also be resilient. Because as we talk about all these things, as we practice all of these things and all of the things we're going to learn in a momentum, the world is going to be going on around us. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a lot of ambiguity. There's going to be a lot of violence. There's going to be, you know, the climate. All of these things will be going on at the mm-hmm. same time. The world's not going to stop because we want to grow. So we have to grow inside of all of that. So the kind of things that I'm talking about, the mindsets, I say, help us to be able to withstand and live in all of that without falling over. And Mm -hmm. so my image of it is the roly-poly toy. It's this big bubble man, you know, it's a toy. And if you push him over, turn him loose, he bounces back. He never falls. You can push him all the way down to the, but he never falls, the roly-poly. And some of them call the wobbly man. That Mm -hmm. that is the kind of resilience we want to be. And I think creating the mindsets, the kind of things we talked about, help us to have that kind of resilience. Yeah, the bounce back. To yeah. be able to bounce back, because you will get bowl over. Yeah, no, oh, yeah. Well, and I think when you do hard work and you know, one of the sessions we'll be doing is about letting go, letting go of hard things, letting go of limiting beliefs, letting go of uh, trauma triggers. And you know, there's that's that's really deep work and you do have to be resilient to stay present when you're still, when you're walking through these things and really trying to conquer them and, um, and claim your happiness, claim your power. And so, um, so yeah, I love that. The, the wobbly man, the roly poly. (laughs) Um, okay. So the last question I ask everybody Mm -hmm. uh, that comes on the podcast is this, what feeds your soul? I think what feeds my soul, hmm, that's a very good question. (laughs) There are two things that feed my soul. One is my faith, which never fails me. I mean, you know, if God doesn't act today, he acts acts today, he's never failing. It's a lot to do with my upbringing and my role model of seeing that happen in my mother. Um, The other thing is what feeds my soul is to realize that a little black girl sat on on a a porch at her home, a small house, and dreamed about the kind of life that I wanted. There was no reason to believe that the dreams I dreamed all come true. I had five scenarios had to do with working in New York, living in Europe, all these things, and to realize that all of them came true. So that feeds me to know what's possible in life. Yeah. 
And dreaming is so important. If you don't have dreams for yourself, then there's just no way it can come. Dreaming is so important. And, you know, Natasha wrote the book, and that's the one I was trying to think of. It's one day she woke up and she asked herself the question, is this where I was going? <laughs> <laughs> dreams dreams don't happen in a long stream. You know, they're ups and downs, but, but the stream keeps going. Now, one of the benefits of aging is not only do you get a chance, hopefully, to realize those dreams, but you have a chance to reflect upon mm. the path and realize that it's been one dream all in the in the same direction as long as you can keep your keep your head and your soul all right. Yeah. I had, you know, I think several months ago now, before I ever even envisioned the momentum effect. I was I was creating these cards, which I have with me almost all the time, morning and afternoon and night. I, I go through my goal cards and my vision cards. And um, and I wrote down, I will create a safe community for women to share about their lives and encourage each other to grow and dream. I had no idea how that was going to happen or what that was going to look like, but I had a dream to, to provide that space for people, to make space for women specifically, to take that next step, to build their next chapter, because I had just, I had just done it. And I was like, all women should have this opportunity. And so, and here it is. And here we sit. And here it is. And there, there are a number <laughs> of forces working. So while you were doing the dreaming and the thinking, quantum physics tell us that you set other forces into motion that supported your ability to do that. You attracted things that would help to support your ability to do that. And there was that need out there. So when you believe, when you dream and believe, I do believe we set other forces in motion that right. help us to make those dreams come true. We don't have to do it without 10 fingers. Right. <laughs> we can just do it all up here. <laughs> but it takes all of it together, I guess. Yeah. Well, Francis, thank you so much. This has been amazing. And I I know that people will be blessed by hearing your words and that and hopefully be inspired to join the momentum effect. And um, and you can find out about that at ckcollins.co forward slash momentum. And there's also information there about Francis. So you can go more in depth on. Um, who she is and how we're going to learn from her. So thank you very much. And um, thanks to everybody out there for tuning in and we'll see you next Wednesday. Kelly's book is available on Amazon and through your local bookstores. Look for the swipe right effect, the power to get unstuck. Kelly's interviews with 10 friends from around the world unlock powerful truths to getting your new life started. <laughs>